Yahweh said to Moshe and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month is to be the beginning of months for you. It is the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, they must each select an animal from the flock according to their father's households, one animal per household. If the household is too small for a whole animal, that person and the neighbor nearest his house are to select one based on the combined number of people. You should apportion the animal according to what each person will eat. You must have an unblemished animal, a year old male. You may take it from either the sheep or the goats. You are to keep it until the 14th day of this month and the whole assembly of the community of Israel will slaughter the animal between the evenings. They must take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses where they eat them. They are to eat the meat that night. They should eat it roasted over the fire along with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or cooked in <coughs> boiling water, but only roasted over fire its head as well as its legs and inner organs. Do not let any of it remain until morning. You must burn up any part of it that does remain before morning. Here is how you must eat it. You must be dressed for travel, your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand. You are to eat it in a hurry. It is Yahweh's Passover. I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and strike every firstborn male in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. I am Yahweh. I will execute judgments against all the mighty ones of Egypt. The blood on the houses where you are staying will be a distinguishing mark for you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. No plague will be among you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day is to be a memorial for you, and you must celebrate it as a festival to Yahweh. You are to celebrate it throughout your generations as a permanent statute. May Yahweh bless His word to our hearts today. May we receive this for what it is. It is not the word of man. It is the word of Almighty Yahweh. We are just a little over a month away from Yahweh's Passover, which means that the new year is right around the corner. Uh, this coming new moon is the first of the year, as Exodus 12 verse 2 just stated. The world's new year, January the 1st, is a date that is completely divorced from the lunar cycle. And really it's also divorced from the solar cycle. It's entirely arbitrary. It was chosen between two guys, Sausigenes and Julius Caesar, back in the late B.C. era. And it was chosen to honor a two-faced Roman deity named Janus, or later Janus with the J. Why would we start a new year when nothing is new? That's the question I asked myself many moons ago. Why would we start a new year when nothing is new? The nights are long, it's cold, the trees are dormant, no birds are singing, no bees are buzzing. It is one of the strangest things if you stop and think about it. And that's because it was arbitrarily chosen to honor a different deity. I have to deal with man-made days and dates, some for secular commercial purposes with work and all. When I call somebody up to schedule a job, I can't tell them, hey, is it okay if I come out there on the 13th day of the 12th moon? And then they hang up and I get no business, right? <laughs> so I have to use the man-made calendar for secular purposes, but I do not recognize it at all spiritually in honor, worship, or in celebration. And I think that's the main thing. The Creator's New Year that we should honor is in the spring. It's what's called the month of Abib. You'll see it right here in Exodus, in the next chapter, Exodus chapter 13, verses 3 through 4, right on the heels of what we just read in Exodus 12. Exodus 13, 3 through 4 says, Then Moshe said to the people, Remember this day when you came out of Egypt, out of the place of slavery, for Yahweh brought you out of here by strength of His hand. Nothing leavened may be eaten. Today, in the month of Abib, you are leaving. That's the month that Moshe and Aaron honored. That's the month all the Hebrew prophets honored. The Messiah himself honored this month. All the Messiah's direct apostles honored the month of Abib. All of them observed the month of Abib, the month that we are now approaching as the head of the year. No holy man or holy woman in this entire collection of books ever celebrated midnight, December 31st, moving into January 1st as the new year. You will not find it in this book. No watch night services, no all night services, no New Year celebrations. It's not in the Bible. But the month of Abib is. The word Abib is a harvest term. 
The Israelites were an agrarian society, and their yearly cycle and their annual festivals were centered around the harvest times. And the harvest times actually are produced by the heavenly light, specifically the sun and the moon, but specifically the sun. I'll talk more about that in just a second. Abib is defined by Brown Drivers and Briggs Hebrew lexicon as, quote, fresh young barley ears, barley, and month of ear forming, of greening of crop, of growing green abib, month of Exodus and Passover, March or April, end of quote. The Apollos Old Testament commentary on Exodus reads at 13 and 4, quote, In the month of the ears of grain, abib by itself refers to ears of grain that are ripe but still soft. So it's linked with the barley harvest in the spring. Barley that was planted in the fall became dormant and then came back in the springtime. And it corresponds to basically, this is not an exact formula for every single year, but most lexicons, Bible dictionaries, commentaries will tell you that the month of Abib corresponds and overlaps the end of our March and the beginning of our April. Deuteronomy 16 verse 1 reads, Observe the month of Abib and celebrate the Passover to Yahweh your mighty one because Yahweh your mighty one brought you out of Egypt by night in the month of Abib. That's a reference to the last of the ten plagues, right? The destroying angel comes through. That's the jump start to bringing them out of Egypt by night and it's the month of Abib. You see that word observe there in 16 and 1? That's the Hebrew word shamar. Shamar basically means to guard or to protect. We protect the month of Abib by honoring the commands associated with this month when it rolls back around on the calendar. And a big part about this is celebrating the Passover. Notice again, observe, shamar, guard and protect the month of Abib and celebrate the Passover to Yahweh, your mighty one. So here, 40 years later, after Exodus 12, the command is still celebrate the Passover. We know the Passover was celebrated, obviously, in Egypt the first time, but we know it was celebrated in the wilderness because of two texts, Numbers 9 and Joshua 5. Numbers 9 in the wilderness, Joshua 5 in the plains of Gilgal. So they're still celebrating the Passover. It's a memorial, a permanent statute, Exodus 12, 14. I realize this sounds strange to the world. It sounds so strange to the world. Most people never hear a sermon like this. It even sounds strange to modern Christianity, the things that I'm talking about. Most of modern Christianity celebrated Christmas this past December, but neither Christmas or December are spoken about in the Bible. They celebrated New Year's on January 1st with late night's church meetings, again, not in in the Bible. Some of the many churches I saw celebrated a Valentine's dinner a couple weeks ago for the couple's not in the Bible. You won't find any of those anywhere in the Bible. But what you will find over and over again is Passover. You'll find other celebrations too. But Passover is what we're talking about right now. And while it seems strange today, it was so common and cherished by the Hebrews. It was so common and cherished by Yeshua. Yeshua lived about 33 years on this earth. And He celebrated Passover the whole entirety of his life. As a matter of fact, he even died at Passover time, and that's not by coincidence. I don't want to get ahead of myself. That's for the end of my sermon. But we find the Passover over and over again. The last commanded festival for the Hebrews was Sukkot and the last great day in the fall, right around the fall, what we call the fall equinox or the fall Tekufa. And then you have the long autumn and the winter. Um, Eventually, in Hebrew history, you had the Feast of Purim come up in the book of Esther. Not commanded, but they began to keep that in celebration of being able to fight back to the people that wanted to kill them. And then also in the Second Temple period, you had the uh, Feast of Dedication, known in Hebrew as Hanukkah. Again, not commanded, but a good feast. Good righteous feast, righteous origins. But the last commanded one was Sukkot. And then you have a long span until eventually when the Hebrews would roll around to about the time that we're in right now, they would anticipate the Passover is here again. Springtime came again. 
produced by the greater light, the sun in the sky. So anticipation came about at Passover time. We get excited for the feasts around here. We do. But the excitement is just magnified when you really sit and think about thousands and thousands, if not a million Hebrews going to the place that Yahweh put His name with shouts and dances and trumpets and animals and sacrifices and rejoicing, wine, beer, a feast of oxen and, and, and sheep. And everybody is excited because Pesach and what's called in Hebrew, Chag Matzot, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, is here. And we get the whole week to celebrate and rejoice and study the Torah. This is a big deal. It's a huge deal. We really need to think about how big of a deal it was. And this all came about because Yahweh, back in the book of Genesis, He established a calendar. He established a clock in the sky. Up above us in the sky is this beautiful clock, the sun and the moon. It may help to think about the sun and the moon like you would the long and short hand on a modern clock or an analog clock. Sister Caitlin brought that up in the Bible study. Neither do what the other does, but each has a specific job that is important for telling time. In Genesis 1, 14 through 18, we read this. Then Elohim said, the Almighty said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night. They will serve as signs for festivals and for days and years. They will be lights in the expanse of the sky to provide light on the earth, and it was so. Elohim made the two great lights, the greater light to have dominion over the day and the lesser light to have dominion over the night as well as the stars. Elohim placed them in the expanse of the sky to provide light on the earth, to dominate the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And the mighty one saw that it was good. Notice here in verse 14, they will serve as signs for festivals. Most Bibles will say seasons right here. And seasons is not wrong, but more specifically, it refers to festivals or holy appointments. That's what's in view here. The Good News Bible reads at verse 14, Let lights appear in the sky to separate day from night and to show the time when days, years, and religious festivals begin. Nahum Sarna, in his commentary on Genesis, this is in the JPS Tanakh commentary series, he writes that these lights are, quote, a gauge by which fixed times, moadim, that's the Hebrew word for seasons or appointed times, moadim, such as new moons, festivals, and the like are determined, as well as the days and the years, end of quote. There's a clock in the sky with the sun and the moon. The sun rises and sets every day, and that naturally produces day and night. It's pretty simple, isn't it? The night begins when the sun sets. The daylight period begins when the sun rises. It's very simple, very simple. But what a lot of people don't know is that the sun also travels what we would call sideways to our view. Uh, a little bit each day. During the springtime, the sun rises due east and sets due west. The old saying, I remember Granddaddy saying when I was a little boy, grandson, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. And that's only actually technically true two days out of the year. What we call the spring equinox and the fall equinox. Uh, the Hebrew term for that would be tekufa. It's turning points in relation to the, the heavenly lights uh, as they move in the sky. So during the springtime, the sun rises due east and sets due west. Later in the summer, it will rise far northeast and set far northwest, spending more time in the sky, producing long daylight time. That's why our days are longer in the summer than they are in the spring or, or in the winter. But after that, the sun treks back a little each day until autumn or fall, where it again rises due east and sets due west. And then finally, a little each day, it inches into winter, where it rises far southeast and sets far southwest. That happens the winter solstice, the word solstice means basically sun stands still or sun stop. Okay? So the winter solstice would be on our calendar what we call December the 21st. That's the, the longest night and the shortest day of the year. It's because the sun is rising real far southeast and setting real far southwest. And you kind of see the depiction there on the screen. This produces the four seasons of the year that we call spring, summer, fall, and winter. 
And that in turn produces the religious Hebrew festivals and actually all three of the festivals are tied to the first three to Kufa or to Kufot of the year, spring, Passover, summer, Pentecost, and fall tabernacles. From spring to spring, we have a solar year that is produced. Inside this is what we might call the other hand on the clock, the moon. The English words month and moon are related. They both come from the Greek word main. In Greek, you have the word main, which can mean moon or month, and you have the other word pneumania, which means new moon. So when we use the word month, it's related to the word moon. The moon produces the months of the year, lasting either 29 or 30 days. Uh, we see a vestige of this. I mentioned it before in previous lessons, but everybody slept since then, <laughs> so I'll say it again. Uh, we have a vestige of this in the English word honeymoon, where after a husband and a wife or a, a man and a woman, they get married and they go on a honeymoon. And originally it referred to the first month of their marriage. And actually, when you study the word honey out, it refers to the honey ale that they would share, the sweetness of the of the alcohol that they would share as they now were married and started their life as a husband and wife. You don't have to believe me. Everybody's got the internet now, so you can check me out. But we see a vestige of the moon for the months in the word honeymoon. Each month begins at the new moon, and that's why you see new moon celebrations all through the Hebrew Scripture. I can't believe there was a time in my life, Brother Jerry, I didn't know anything about the new moon. But it's been in here the whole time. One example of this is Isaiah 66, 22 through 23, where a prophecy about the future new heavens and new earth says that we, the saved, will worship Yahweh from one new moon to another. I want you to think about this in relation to how we keep Sabbath. One new moon to another and one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come before me and worship mm. I think that's the understanding there. But you'll find many verses where new moons and Sabbaths are mentioned right there together, right there together. So inside of each month, you have moon or month, you have four weeks tied to the quarter phases of the moon. So you have the new moon, that's day one all by itself. And then after day one, you have four weeks, seven days apiece. Four times seven is 28 plus one. Is 29. So when you get through with the month, guess what? You back, basically back around to the new moon again because lunar months contain either 29 or 30 days. All of this is in the Bible. Nobody told me this for the first 16 plus years of my life. Psalm 104 verse 19 says, HCSB, He made the moon to mark the seasons. That word seasons is the Hebrew word moadim. Same word as Genesis 1.14. The sun knows when to set. Later editions of the Holman Christian Standard Bible now read, He made the moon to mark the festivals. The New English translation reads here, He made the moon to mark the months and the sun sets according to a regular schedule. There's a clock in the sky. If you turned off the sun and the moon, time as we know it would cease to exist. It'd be one long, dark period of time. The only reason we have time is the heavenly lights, their movement plus conjunction. That's the only reason we have time. Yahweh established this back in the book of beginnings. We learn so much in the book of beginnings, especially those first 11 chapters. We learn so much there in Genesis. But He established this with His two great lights. He's the one that appointed the two great lights in Genesis 1.14 for signs, seasons, days, and years. He's the one that established that calendar. I don't understand why we wouldn't want to go by his calendar and instead look to a man-made calendar for our appointed times. It doesn't make any sense to me. So it's a calendar in the sky that none of us can control, none of us can manipulate. We just do our very best to abide by what he is telling us with his lights. The sun does what the moon cannot do, and the moon does what the sun cannot do. And do you know in the Bible that the sun and the moon are likened to a husband and a wife? When Joseph had a dream that the sun, the moon, and 11 stars bowed down to him in Genesis 37, immediately his father, Jacob, said, Shall I, your mother, and your brethren bow down to you? How many brothers did Joseph have? 11. That's the 11 stars. 12 counting Joseph. You know there's 12 major constellations in the heavens? 
See, all of this we might think, oh, this sounds like some kind of fortune telling. <laughs> no, all of this is right here in the Bible. Somebody told me one time, the witches use the full moon, Brother Matthew. The witches use the new moon. <laughs> A lot of times the pagans will take things from the righteous people. It's not just that people have appropriated wickedness and brought it into Christianity. Sometimes pagans have taken things that were originally pure and tried to corrupt them into their heathenism. Mm -hmm. The rainbow is a great example of this. The rainbow is a sign in Genesis 8 that Yahweh will never flood the earth again and that seed time and harvest will always remain day and night, cold and heat, summer and winter will always remain. What has <coughs> happened to the rainbow? Mm -hmm. Well, people that promote a lifestyle of homosexuality have taken that sign, that beautiful sign of the rainbow, and appropriated it and taken it over and said, this now stands for something that Yahweh directly condemns against in Leviticus 18, verse 22. So that's exactly what's happened. If you see somebody that says the witches go by the full moon, you say, yeah, they stole it from us. <laughs> We're taking back what's ours. Right? We used to sing a song in church, I went to the enemy's camp and took back what he stole from me. I don't know if the devil steals all that kind of stuff from us or not, but sometimes the enemy does steal righteous things and we take them back and we, we redeem them in the way that Yahweh has, has commanded us to. So I don't believe in horoscopes or you know studying the constellations to try to predict my future. But they are up there for a reason. And this message is not about the zodiac or the stars. He said the word zodiac. <laughs> it's not about the zodiac or the star. Zodiac actually isn't a bad word. The word zodiac comes from an Arabic word that means the way or the path. And it refers to the sun's path through the constellations. The sun has months too. The sun produces 30-day months, segments of 30 days apiece. And the zodiac actually shows us the ages, the age of Aries, the ram. The age as we're going into now of Aquarius, the water bearer, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, I believe is what it signifies. There's meaning to all of this. And if we just try to study it in light of how Yahweh talked about it, like in the book of Job and the book of Amos, the constellations are, are mentioned. I got off on a rabbit trail. <laughs> the sun and the moon in the Bible are likened to a husband and wife. I said that the sun does what the moon cannot do. The moon do, does what the sun cannot do. The husband does what the wife cannot do. The wife does what the husband cannot do. In Scripture, marriage is complementarianism. It's complementary. It's just like when we look at the colors on the wall here of the sanctuary. They complement one another. That's what a husband and a wife are to do in the marriage. Not fight, but work together as a team. And that's what the sun and the moon do. And if we boot the moon out of the calendar or the sun out of the calendar, it's like we divorce the husband and the wife and we cause chaos in our calendar. That's why I can't support any calendar that only uses the sun or only uses the moon. They're deficient. They're divorced calendars. We've got to use both the sun and the moon. Let there be lights, plural, in the heavens for signs, seasons, days, and years. So it's a beautiful illustration, the husband and wife there. In the book of Sirach, the wisdom of Sirach, or Ecclesiasticus, Ecclesiasticus means church book, and it's because this used to be a book that was read in churches on a regular basis. This is one of the books that was originally in the King James Bible, but later removed. Look at this in chapter 43, verses 2 through 8, Good News Translation. The sun, when it appears, proclaims as it rises how marvelous a thing it is made by the Most High. At noon it dries up the land. No one can stand its blazing heat. The setting sun sets fire to the hilltops like a metal furnace glowing from the heat. It sends out fiery rays, blinding the eyes with its brightness. The Lord, Yahweh, who made it, is great. It speeds on its way at His command. There is also the moon. Marking the passage of time, an eternal sign of the changing seasons. The moon determines the holy days. Its light grows full and then grows dim. The month is named after the moon, marvelous to watch as it grows fuller each night, a signal light for the heavenly armies shining out in the dome of the sky. Isn't all of that wonderful? That's a beautiful text. That's a beautiful text. I know it's not something that you hear at Sunday morning church service. I know that. 
But there were not any Sunday morning church services in here. <laughs> They're not in there. As a matter of fact, what are two things that the New Testament church didn't have? They didn't have a New Testament. They didn't have a church. <laughs> they worshiped in the synagogue. James chapter 2 or 3, I think it's chapter 2, says that there enter into your assembly a man with a gold ring. The word assembly there is synagogue in the Greek. It's a synagogue. The early believers, both Jew and Gentile, would worship on Shabbat in the synagogue, the local place where they sang the Torah, studied the Torah, read the Torah, preached the Torah, said the prayers, said the Shema, which we try to do here, but I guarantee you even the first century synagogue would be a little bit foreign to even us. We'd be a little more comfortable because we go through these things, but I don't know that we do them to the level and effect that they did them in the first century. We try. We try. But these people were raised generation after generation after generation with the study of Yahweh's Torah, recognizing the feast days. And when they rolled back around, this is what the little children, the little Hebrew children, got excited about. It's Pesach time again. And it's the Feast of Unleavened Bread again. Hallelujah. We get to go to Jerusalem and rejoice and see our friends that maybe we hadn't seen all year long or since the last feast. Oh, this is so wonderful. It's so beautiful. No holy man or woman in this entire Bible. Catch this. This is, this is a shocker, I know, to a lot of people. <laughs> but no holy man or woman in this whole Bible went to church on Sunday morning. <laughs> now, I know that's kind of common to us, and we think, we think, yeah, that's not a big shock factor, but you, you tell somebody that, and they don't realize it. The closest text, and I have a whole sermon on Acts 20, verse 7. That's the closest text that comes to a Sunday worship service. But it, and it is on the first day of the week, but it's, it's an oneg. It's after Shabbat when they would gather together and fellowship and eat, eat the meal. And it's because Shaul, Shaliot, the Apostle Paul, had to leave the next morning and they wanted to spend as much time with the Apostle as they could before he left. And so... And the King James will say Paul preached to them, but that word preach in the Greek doesn't mean preached. It means discussed reason. Everywhere else in the New Testament it's translated discussed reason. They discussed the Scriptures like we do. And they got into it so much and they had an apostle. An apostle was there. Imagine if we had a direct apostle of Yeshua the Messiah that came into our midst. Do you think we'd want to spend all night with him? I know I would. I'd have a section, a whole section, a notebook of questions <laughs> be ready to ask him. Now, I, want to, I want to monopolize his time. That's what was taking place in Acts chapter 20. It wasn't a regularly occurring Sunday service, and it wasn't even in the morning. It was at night. They stayed up all night. There were many lights in the upper chambers. All of this is in Scripture. All the Hebrews, even all the, the Elohim fearers from among the Gentiles, when they joined, they would worship Yahweh on the Sabbaths, the new moons, and the set feasts. Cornelius in Acts 10, he didn't go to church on Sunday morning. That's right. He was well known by the Jewish community. Why? Because he wanted to practice their ways. I might start preaching if I'm not careful here. <laughs> Look at Luke chapter 2 with me. This is after the birth narrative about Yeshua. Remember, Yeshua was conceived in the womb of a virgin woman, a woman that had never been intimate with a man, the virgin Mary, Miriam. He was born... And then after the time of the uncleanness, the ritual uncleanness period, which for a, a male child was 40 days, according to Leviticus chapter 12. After that time period, Miriam and Yusuf and Yeshua, they traveled to Jerusalem, to Jerusalem. Why? To present Yeshua to Yahweh. Because it's written in the Torah in Exodus 13, all the firstborn males are to be dedicated before Yahweh. And they offered up a sacrifice. And we know that they were poor because what they offered up was the designated sacrifice for people that weren't as wealthy as others based on the book of Leviticus. Well, then in verse 40 in Luke chapter 2, it says that the young boy, talking about Yeshua, he grew up and he became strong, filled with wisdom, and Yahweh, the mighty one's grace or favor, was on him. And then look at verses 41 through 42. This is the only canonical text that we have about the childhood or the adolescent time of Yeshua. It says, Every year 
his parents traveled to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom of the festival. That's because at that time in Hebrew history, the city of Jerusalem was the place where Yahweh put his name. We just read about it in Deuteronomy 16. Three times a year you go to the place that Yahweh put his name. And that, that's not just talking about Jerusalem. There, were, there was another location prior to that that Yahweh had his name, but he removed it from there because of some sin uh, in the priesthood. In the time period of the wilderness, you know, they were doing everything, whatever was right in their own eyes. That's not necessarily a bad term. It's just that they had not entered into the rest, and so they weren't traveling, doing a pilgrimage uh, for the feast. But here at this time, they were. And the city that Yahweh was worshipped and where he placed his name or his authority was, was Jerusalem. Deuteronomy says three times in the year all the males are to appear before Yahweh. Passover was the first time. Pentecost was the second time. Tabernacles was the third time in the year. This is when the tithes were paid, brothers and sisters. Here's another thing. They didn't bring tithes to the synagogue every Shabbat. Definitely didn't bring it to the Sunday morning church service. The tithes were paid three times a year. And the majority of them probably were at Sukkot because that's when everything was gathered in. And tithes were on produce and livestock. You could turn them into money, but they were on produce and livestock commanded. There was monetary offerings called teruma in the scriptures. That's okay. That's fine. I'm not against monetary offerings. But tithing was mainly on produce and livestock so that the Levites could eat and the widows and the fatherless, the orphans, would be taken care of. And the stranger that sojourned among you, they would be taken care of. And then the worshiper himself and herself could eat some of the tithe that they brought. Deuteronomy chapter 14. We read that recently. The males are specified in the Torah not to the neglect of the females, but simply because Israel was a patriarchal society. The husbands were the, the leaders or the heads of their home. But we just read in Deuteronomy 16, the wife, the children, the Levite, the stranger, they were all at the feast rejoicing before Yahweh. Okay, So all the males appeared it doesn't mean that the females were not, were not there. As a matter of fact, verse 41, every year his parents, plural, his mom and dad, Travel to the Passover. Do you know how long it is from the time frame of Exodus 12, my opening text, to the time frame of Luke chapter 2? It's approximately 1,400 years between those two time frames. 1,400 years and the Hebrews are still keeping Passover. That's 1,000 400 Passovers, and they haven't stopped. You know why they hadn't stopped? Exodus 12, 14. This day shall be to you as a memorial. You shall keep it as a feast forever throughout your generations. They took it for what it said, brothers and sisters. Forever meant forever to them. Generations meant as long as Israel keeps having generations. The English word Passover is found about 76 times in the Bible. That might vary depending on which translation you read. Easter is found one time in the King James Version of Acts 12, verse 4. And if you look carefully, that's talking about Passover too. Now, there is a lot of technicality in history on Acts 12, verse 4. It's not for this sermon. All right, I can give you a sermon series on it if you want. But I just want to mention one thing here is that when you look up the word Easter in the Greek text of the New Testament, it is the Greek word Pasha. And Pasha is the Greek equivalent of the Aramaic word Pasha, which stems from the Hebrew word Pesach. They're all related. And we say Passover. William Tyndale coined the word, probably, coined the word Passover. Um, but the Hebrew would be the Pesach. So Easter Sunday sunrise service, zero times. It seems so obvious to me which one we should focus on. Yet the majority today neglect Yahweh's Passover and choose to celebrate Easter Sunday instead. Now, I've went over a lot of information in today's lesson. And what I wanted to do is start stirring up your minds by way of reminder. The Apostle Peter said, I've written this second epistle to you to stir up your minds by way of reminder. So as Passover approaches, I don't want to just, bam, go into it all of a sudden at one day. I want to get our heart and our minds ready. It is my personal favorite feast of the year. That doesn't mean it has to be yours. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another man esteemeth. Yes, that's fine. You can esteem Pentecost or Tabernacles if that's your esteem. 
Passover is my favorite, but it is one of Yahweh's appointments, and we need to get our heart and our mind ready. Listen, when Yahweh's appointments roll back around on the calendar, everything else needs to shut off. I had a hard preparation day yesterday. Nothing was going my way. I was getting frustrated. If I cussed, I would have been letting them fly. <laughs> everything was going wrong. And we were about two to three hours before Shabbat. And I could tell that my mind was wanting to continue to think about the work week. And all of a sudden, the Spirit prompted me and said, Matthew, it's the Holy Shabbat. It's time to cut everything off. This will all be here the day after the Sabbath. You can pick it back up. Yahweh said you have six days to labor and do all your work. On the seventh day, He said it's my Sabbath. You unplug from the world. Spend more time studying the Word. Spend time resting your body. We come to have a holy convocation. This is His day. What if He would have asked us to come here and do this six days and gave us one? What if He would asked us for 90% and gave us 10%? He did. He asked for one day out of seven. Oh, yeah. And only 10% out of 100. He's a great mighty one. When His days roll around, that should be what's on our mind and our heart. That should be where our emphasis lies. Listen, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. When his feast days roll around, including Sabbaths and new moons, get your mind and your heart right before it ever shows up. Guard the borders of his holy days. And I promise you that the Sabbaths, new moons, and feasts will be more rewarding if you have planned accordingly. And when they get there, you can say, oh, I feel relaxed and I'm ready. Get your heart right. Do more prayer, more fasting, more giving to the poor. The three types of righteousness Yeshua talks about in Matthew 6. Get your mind and your heart right for His holy days. I wanted to stir up your minds by way of reminder in this lesson. We should never forget about why we do all the things we do here as an assembly in honor of Almighty Yahweh because if we quit reminding ourselves, things will slowly slip away. All of these children in here... They hear the verses quoted. They see the feast kept. And if they were pulled out of this assembly for one year, they may not forget it completely, but it would start to slip away. Then the second year, they would forget more. Third year, forget more. Eventually, if they don't do them for 10 years, they no longer are part of their life and they no longer think they're important. And that could go for all of us adults as well. That's why we continue to do these things over and over. And so long as we continue to remind ourselves and keep the festivals when they roll around, we will continuously be reminded of great happenings in the history of past Israel, and it also will point us to great messianic occurrences. All of this is about Yeshua the Messiah. All of these feasts are. The Bible says that the Sabbaths, the new moons, and the festivals are shadows of things to come. People read that as a derogatory thing. That's not derogatory. Paul writes this in Colossians 2. Most people read it as though Paul said they were shadows of things that already came. That's not what Paul said. Writing to an, a first century messianic assembly in Colossae, he says the feasts right now are present tense, shadows of things to come in the future. Some things that the feast pointed to have already happened. Yeshua died at Passover time. He resurrected on wave sheaf day. Holy Spirit poured out in Acts 2 at Shavuot or Pentecost. So those shadows were fulfilled. The fulfillment did not negate the, the physical practice of those feasts. Just because Yeshua died at Passover doesn't mean we don't keep Passover anymore. Just because the Holy Spirit was poured out and the apostles were baptized with the Holy Spirit in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost doesn't mean we don't keep Pentecost anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and even the modern church understands that. They have Pentecost celebrations. But they're shadows, and they're still shadows now of things yet to come. We await future things that the Sabbath, new moons, and feasts predict or show forth or type. Yeshua is the great shadow caster. This is a good infographic from 119 Ministries that, about Colossians 2. I just want to read this. It says, Paul in context, Colossians 2, 16 through 17, what Paul is not saying, 
The feast, Sabbaths, and dietary laws are insignificant, so don't judge anyone who doesn't keep them. No. Colossians 2, 16-17, what Paul is saying. The feast, Sabbaths, and dietary laws are all really important. Prophetic shadow pictures of the Messiah. So don't let those who are persecuting you judge you for your obedience to God's commandments. I think that's a good short synopsis right there of Colossians 2. Picture Yeshua standing beside you on a sunny day. And you see him in his person and he's cast in a shadow. And when you look at his shadow, you see Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles, New Moon, Sabbath. That's the shadow he casts. The reason you see those things is because he is associated with those things and all of those things point to him in some way. It's kind of like a man in the military who's gone for a long time from his wife. Say years. And used to, we used to keep pictures in our billfold or our wallet. Now we have them on our phone. But you remember when you, people used to keep a picture of their loved ones in their wallet, you know, a little picture for places. And this man takes a picture of his wife with him and he's got it. He, he gets in the bunk bed, he's in the military, and he looks up and he's got that picture of his wife stuck up there and he pulls it down. And it's not the reality of his wife, but it's still important to him because it. it it's a type of his wife. It reminds him of his wife. He may even tell that picture, I love you. He may even kiss that picture, not because he's worshiping it or bowing down to it or anything, but because he appreciates and he misses his wife. Sabbath, new moons, and feasts are shadows, pictures of the reality. When we keep the appointed times, we are walking in the shadow of the things to come. We went up to Pennsylvania one time when Rosalind was born, almost 20 years ago. And we kept the feast days with Rabbi Dombeck, Harry Dombeck, and his wife. They had a huge tent for Sukkot, and they had written a song. We are walking in the shadow of the things to come. And I remember Don, Brother Dombeck was looking at me and smiling and point. We are walking in the shadow of the greater things to come. The Sabbaths, the new moons, and the Moedim. We are walking in the shadow of the greater things to come. <laughs> he said, do you like that, Brother Matthew? <laughs> I said, Brother, I love it. I love it, I love it. Brothers and sisters, our precious Messiah is what this is all about. He is what all of this pointed to and still points to in His final coming. He came the first time bodily and physically. He will come back another time, finally, bodily and and physically. He says in Acts 1, the angel there says, Why do you stand gazing? This same Yeshua that you see taken up will come back in like manner. He left bodily and physically. He's coming back bodily and physically. Doesn't matter how long that it's been. People mock. People scorn. People say, Why do you believe that? It's been 2,000 years since the so-called first coming of the Messiah. And I just am reminded of 2 Peter 3 because Peter says, that the time allotment is because Yahweh is so merciful and He's long-suffering and He wants to get as many people in that will serve Him. Are we ready for His return? If we walk in His ways, we'll be ready when He shows up. We don't have to know the day or the hour of His return. He said, no man knows the day nor the hour. The angels in heaven don't know. He said, I don't even know. He said, but my Father knows. You know how we'll be ready without knowing? We just work for Him while He's gone. Matthew 24, 46 says, The servant whose master finds him working when he comes will be rewarded. There is so much going on in the world today, brothers and sisters, so much that will take your attention and put it elsewhere. Don't get wrapped up in all of that, what the world wants you to focus on. Don't let the media tell you what to think about. You think about Yahweh's Word. Psalm 1 says that the righteous man meditates on the Torah both day and night. All of this around us will eventually be burned up. And the new heavens and new earth will be here wherein dwells righteousness. And we'll be still walking in His ways. Focus on Yahweh. Focus on the Messiah. Focus on the commandments. Get your house in order. Sweep the floor of your heart. Clean out the closet of your soul. Do not worry what other people think about you. Be kind to them. Be gentle to them, yes. But realize the natural man cannot understand the things of the Spirit. And don't let anybody hold you back from serving the Creator. 
that's my sermon for today. I'm going to talk more about some aspect of Passover next week, Yahweh's will. For now, I love you and I appreciate you. Yahweh is good, isn't he? Amen, sir. Listen, may Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and bring you peace. I love everybody here. Hallelujah.